welcome and good evening to the City of Shakopee City Council meeting for March 19th, 2019. Item number one, if we could call the roll. Council Member Brennan. Here. Council Member Lehman. Here. Mayor Mars. Here. Council Member Whiting. Here. Council Member Contreras. Here. Thank you. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, approval of the agenda. Any changes, corrections? Mr. Reynolds. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have several. Uh, we're going to remove item 4B3. We will also remove item 11A. And uh, 4D2, just to be clear, uh, it actually went out. Uh, the resolution R2019 TAC 018 did go out and was properly noticed, but it, didn't, it was not included in some of your packets. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that that resolution did go out with the regular notice. That's all from staff, sir. All right. Other changes, corrections? Councilor Whining. Make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I have a motion and a... I'll second. Second by Councilor Brennan. Further discussion? Discussion? <clears throat> discussion all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> Item number four, consent agenda. Are there any changes, additions? Uh, Councilor Whiting. Pull 4D1, please. 4D1. Uh, Councilor Brennan. 4B1. 4B1. Councilor Lehman. 4A3, 4A4, 4B2. <clears throat> 4D2. All right. So I have... Uh, 4A3, 4A4, 4B1, 4B2, 4D2, and 4, or I said 4D1 and 4D2. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Councilor Whiting? Mr. Mayor, if we can run uh, 4D1 first, it'd be appropriate. Okay. Um, motion on the table. Motion. Make what was it? Uh, um, I'll move the agenda as amended. Or. Consent agenda is modified. Yeah. Um, Councilor Contreras will second that. Yes, um, before we vote, we will read the modified <coughs> consent agenda into the public record. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and our honored guests. This is, these are the consent agenda items for March 5th of 2019. 4A1 approves minutes from the March 5th and 12th, 2019 meetings. 4A2 adopts resolution number R2019 TAC 009, which closes the 2008A Improvement Bonds 3042 Debt Service Fund and the Community Center and ICE Arena 4073 Capital Project Fund into the 2016A Tax Abatement Debt Service mm -hmm. Fund. 4C1 declares bicycles and miscellaneous property held by the police department as surplus property and authorizes their proper sale or disposal. 4C2 declares five forfeited vehicles as surplus property held by the police department as surplus, as surplus property and authorizes their proper sale or disposal. 4D3 adopts resolution number R2019-034, which approves plans and orders the advertisement for vids for the 12th Avenue reconstruction project, which is CIF-19-004. And 4D4 adopts resolution number R2019-033, which accepts work on the 2018 Bituminous Overlay Project, which is project CIF-18-002, and the 2018 Community Center Back Parking Lot Project, which is PA-18-13, and makes a final payment of $66,577.31. Thank you very much. The consent agenda. A motion's on the table and a second for the consent agenda. The consent agenda has been read into the public record. There would be no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, <coughs> motion carries. Thank you. Item number five. Now I'd like to call on any resident that would like to come forward and make a 
comment on an item not on the agenda. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and welcome on an item not on the agenda. Seeing none, we would move ahead then to item number six, business removed from consent. And we will start with uh, 4D1. Uh, Councilor Whiting. Mr. Mayor, this is a, a notice we had uh, for a resolution um, uh, expressing appreciation for and accepting the retirement and resignation of Mike Hollander. Who's Mike Hollander? No. I, I know who the Mike Hollander is. That's uh, Pinky. Uh, Pinky Hollander. So I uh, didn't understand that. But uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, uh, council members and, and, and uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Pinky has been with this organization for one heck of a long time. And uh, as we've been uh, reviewing uh, uh, some of the things that he's, he's done over the years, uh, he has a lot of reason to, to uh, leave our organization and go into retirement with, with you know, frankly, a lot of, uh, of, of, of chits, uh, a lot of medals on his chest in my old, uh, my old career. Uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be a loss to, to see him go. Uh, we're appreciative of his many years of service. And with that being said, Mr. Mayor, we have something to present to him if you'd like to uh, read it or I can read it or... Me? Oh, no. <laughs> One of those whereas things? This is. <laughs> <laughs> we want him to stand up here and uh, <laughs> come up into the bright lights if you'd like. <laughs> um, that's good. That's uh, perfect. Crash a street within within throwing works. distance. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of a thankful community, thank you very much. This is a resolution of the city of Shakopee expressing appreciation for and accepting the retirement and resignation of Mike Hollander. Whereas, Mike Hollander grew up uh, in Shakopee and began working for the city of uh, Shakopee in the Public Works Department in 1979. Whereas, Mr. Hollander is a loyal employee of Public Works Department with a consistent base of knowledge and stability having worked as the superintendent for the stormwater, sanitary sewer, fleet, parks, and street divisions. Whereas, Mr. Hollander was instrumental in the cleanup operations and the aftermath of one of the most difficult storms in the city of Shockby's history in 1998, including working around the clock to clear streets for other services to get people in and out of our community. Whereas, Mr. Hollander provided high quality, safe, playable fields for thousands of softball and baseball players throughout the years. Whereas, Mr. Hollander was influential in the layout and design of existing public works facility. Whereas Mr. Hollander has been innovative, efficient, and budget frugal with equipment and maintenance practices, all the while adjusting and evolving to meet the needs of the city's substantial population growth for over four decades. Whereas Mr. Hollander was instrumental in developing the pavement preservation plan throughout the growth and increased transportation needs of the city, which is currently home to approximately 160 miles of city streets. Whereas, after providing 39 years of exemplary service, Mr. Hollander will retire from his position as Public Works Superintendent with the City of Shakopee on March 29, 2019. Now, therefore, let it be resolved the City Council of the City of Shakopee hereby accepts with regret the resignation of Mr. Mike Hollander, Public Works Superintendent, effective March 29, 2019. Let it further be resolved that the City Council of the City of Shakopee extends Mike Hollander a sincere thank you, congratulations, and best wishes for a long and happy retirement. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I noticed this was on a consent agenda, and if somebody didn't take it off, I planned on taking it off myself. At the very minimum, Pinky, you deserve a public thank you for your many years of service to the community and the, and the taxpayers of Shakopee. All of them years, as far back as I can go, to my 
1976 red, white, and blue bicycle, if you recall, um, were above and beyond the call of what a normal employee would have done. Um, you're, you're irreplaceable to this community in your service. There's nothing more than I can do than thank you publicly. And if I could, I'd like to shake your hand and thank you. Uh, Pinky, uh, you've, <coughs> you've done an amazing job. Uh, anytime anybody that I'm aware of needed anything, you were there for them. Uh, either that or you had it done already. So uh, I guess in your retirement, uh, you might have to work on a consultant fee. So when we uh, have to find that missing storm sewer pipe, uh, and you know exactly where it is, you know, you can get that consultant fee taken care of. Very, very frugal consultancy. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, I would like to uh, publicly <laughs> thank you myself and appreciate it. Let's take a group photo here. I'm glad you got your hair cut for us. Thank you. You told me to wear it. Yeah. Come to your office to make sure you did. Cake pop on the floor. All right. Let's move ahead then on other items on consent. Um, Pinky, we do have a box for that plaque if you'd like. Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. All right, um, other items removed from consent. Back up to 4B1, uh, Councilor Brennan. 4A3. 4A3 and 4A4. 4A3 and 4A4. 4A3 and 4A4. I apologize. 4A3, uh, Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I'm, I'm actually gonna combine the two together, 4A3 right. and 4A4. I'm not feeling very well tonight. I probably ain't gonna be here all night. Um, I emailed Mr. Uh, Nelson, finance director, that I'd like to sit down and talk about these two changes. They're pretty substantial compared to the last uh, 18 years. Unfortunately, I worked yesterday, and then after work, I went to Spock. Um, didn't get in here back. Um, so I'd like the opportunity to have that sit-down discussion. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't feel very good tonight. I'm not going to sit here and have a two-hour no, discussion about it. Uh, cultural lighting. <clears throat> is there any timeline where we need to move this ahead? No, there isn't. No. Then I would offer a motion to table. To the next meeting. Yeah. I'll second it. I have a motion to table 4A3, 4A4. I have a second. Um, no further discussion on table. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Now I apologize. Back to 4B1, Councilor Brennan. Um, thank you. I did remove this from the agenda. Um, I wanted to um, find out more information. Um, I had looked at the um, different conditions that are out there for the that were put in place by the Shakopee Public Utilities. So I wanted to go through those and see ask questions on those. Hey, Michael. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So this is the Windermere South Second Edition Final Plat. 
This is the location. Um, it's adjacent to the current DR Horton project and the church on the corner. Um, based on what council member um, Brennan said, there are um, several outlets that will be used in uh, future subdivisions. So these have been set aside. Um, the area shown in red are the ones that currently can be served by the booster station. If you remember from the uh, discussion we had with Spuck, uh, a lot of that capacity is gonna take, be taken up by the BHS project. And then these are the proposed trails and sidewalks. So we do have an extensive network through the project. And then these uh, were the conditions placed on by Spuck and Joe Adams is here. Um, he'd be happy to address some of your concerns. So until the booster station goes live on October 1st, how many lots is the developer limited to? The ones, uh, mayor and council, the ones outlined in red. Um, there, in are red. Some, there are some pressure issues and some fire flow issues and the developer's been aware of that. I think um, Shakopee Public Utilities has been working uh, quickly to get the booster station built and they've awarded the contract and their plans are to have that online October 1st. So there's still a lot of work, grading work and street work that needs to be done on this project. And as soon as the weather breaks, I think they'll begin construction. But Mike Sewell's here from DR Horton and Joe Adams is here from Spuck. Other questions of staff? Um, I have one question, and maybe this is for um, um, Spock, but do you know if there's a location yet for the um, water tower? In Mr. Adams will be able to give you more exact, but they've been working on a location with an adjoining property owner for some time, and he'll be able to update you on that. Okay. Uh, questions come uh, Mr. Adams. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor Mars, and city council members and city staff. Uh, my name is Joe Adams. I'm the Shakopee Public Utilities Commission's Planning and Engineering Director. Um, <clears throat> I'm not at liberty to identify the exact parcel, but we are working on a parcel to acquire uh, this year uh, and put in a design and an application to the city for a, a water tower site in the second high elevation service district. Okay. Um, I, I, Mr. Adams, I found this unique that it seems like the utility is holding back uh, market-driven development here and because of the lack of water and uh, is that a fair statement or? Is well, there's a lack of pressure until right. the booster station comes online. So working with our uh, consulting engineers at SEH, uh, we did extensive modeling of our system without the booster station in place. Uh, do the work by DR Horton. Uh, there is a bypass line incorporated around the booster station site. So there will be water in the pipes for the Windermere uh, South first edition and second edition. But the pressure at certain elevations as you go south and west, everyone knows the elevation rises and you can't push the water uphill. Um, so until the booster station's online, we're advising which lots. Uh, we worked with Tom Pitchneider um, after that modeling was done to identify which lots would have adequate fire protection coverage uh, per the normal policy of having two hydrants within 500 feet of each uh, parcel um, with the structure on it. So there are 14 lots in the um, Windermere South First Edition along Windermere Way down to 128th Street that fall into that category. Uh, in fact, uh, when you go up Amber Glen Circle, there's lots there that are also in the first or second high service district. So these red lots identified in Windermere South Second are um, in addition to those. They uh, developer can build on all those, and these are merely restrictions for occupancy, not for building. You can build on any of the lots. You often have uh, structures going up um, where there is no water service in the rural part of town. The density isn't the same, of course, but the water that is in the uh, zone that has adequate flows could be used by a uh, pumper truck uh, and tanker truck combo 
uh, like they do when they fight fires in the rural area. So we're not by any stretch saying don't build the houses, it's the occupancy. And in conferring with DR Horton's Mike Sewell, um, their schedule for doing the utility, the grading, the site work for this subdivision and getting to a, a point where they can actually begin building a structure is uh, only um, maybe a couple weeks, a month before the booster station should be online. So I don't believe that there's any issue for timing for them that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, I guess we were just talking about development and fees just a week ago, and I know that the bo booster station and the tank have been in your CIP for, for many years, over five years, and then here we are on the cusp of development and the infrastructure is not in the ground and you're not, just seems like you're behind and now I see market, you know, people wanna come and live in our community as they always have and then nice big plat here and, and we gotta wait. Well, I'm, I'm not sure there's any waiting of building buildings and having someone wanting to move in to them. Um, all the lots that have already previously been approved in the earlier plats, Windermere, first, or Windermere and Windermere second, and Windermere south first, and Windermere way, including the BLC site, all can be occupied prior to the booster station coming online. And I don't think timing-wise, physically, there's going to be any of the lots, uh, from what I understand, beyond the ones we identified, that the developer is going to want to or be able to even have occupied by a buyer prior to October 1st. So if I were to buy one of those red lots, so I couldn't you move, could in, move in until October? No, you could occupy that as soon as uh, the city gave an occupancy permit without the booster station in place. We're saying the pressure there is adequate. Beyond the red to the south and west, it would not be until the booster station comes online. And then back on the question on the tank, um, uh, in negotiation to buy a tank, would you uh, start construction in the 2019 building season for that? The CIP uh, calls for acquisition of a site in design and going out for bids so that construction would be during the 2020 construction season. Other questions? Um, can I? Uh, um, there, I was looking through the West End concept plan that was completed in 2016, and in this, this um, booster station and, and water tank were included on that plan, um, and then it was also included in the um, preliminary plat that was done last year. And how typ typically, how long, it, once it's on that plan and once it is, it's in that preliminary plat, do you take a look at it and determine how quickly you're gonna actually implement it? Well, we look at it each year when reviewing and preparing the five-year capital improvement plan for the commission's consideration. So it's been in the five-year plan. We've been working with uh, the city's projections, the landowner and developer's projections as to the timing. The tank um, is desired to be at a higher elevation than the elevations provided by lots in this plat. We want to put it at a higher elevation so that the tank itself is a shorter tank and therefore less costly and more ideally centrally situated to serve the second high zone. So uh, in order to build the tank, we first need um, the water main extended from the booster station to the tank site. This plat for the second edition encompasses many more lots and area than the first edition did and it's fortunate that this will result in pushing the water main far enough west and south that we would conceivably, buying property that we're in discussions with, be able to then independently extend it to the tank itself with the construction schedule dependent only on the commission's uh, uh, budget, which is set for, as I said, <laughs> construction in 2020. In advance, anticipated to be in advance before all these, I think there's 125 lots in the subdivision, plus the other lots that are in the second high zone um, are, are fully occupied. And the booster station will carry the load until then. 
Councilor Lehman. Mr. Adams, let's see if I can get this correct. We could have built the booster <laughs> station and the storage facility for the second high elevation 10 years ago, but then if development didn't happen in this area, we'd have infrastructure sitting there that we're not using. In theory, yes. Okay. Um, and then, 10 and then, years ago, nothing was developed west of County Road 15. And then on the other side of that, when you see that the development is starting to happen and it's working up that hill, <clears throat> you build the infrastructure to serve what's coming up the hill and eventually the same process is gonna happen on a third high elevation, correct? Um, at this time, we have a normal, a first, and a second. We okay. don't anticipate a and third is, unless we spill beyond the present annexation is plan Is this the area. second? This is the second. Okay. Our highest, our third and where where was the transition between the normal and the first? Um, when the hospital campus was constructed and we crossed the new 169 highway, when we got up above uh, to the south of 17th Avenue, running along that corridor roughly is the pressure zone boundary between the normal and the first high. That's and that's why we built a booster station at Pump House 9 along Sarazen Street coincident with the construction of the St. Francis Regional Medical Center. And then the tower on top of Marshall Hill there serves that area? Yes, both towers. The more recent tower, seven on Wood Duck Trail, the ground storage tank actually um, is a two million gallon tank. But the initial tower was the one on Dominion, which is above Valley View Road. And it's a little bit kind of the uh, base of it and the uh, shafted are hidden by the tree line, but it sits above that that area in Dominion uh, Hills subdivision. That's a 500,000 gallon tank. Okay. This is kind of the red here is the upper upper edge of the first high with a booster station before we really need to get to the second high with the tank and go. It, it's technically in the first, in the second high zone. It, the, these lots, they're all in the second Pumping high zone. Water uphill. But um, the the elevations are uh, going to result in barely uh, uh, amount, the bare amount needed for fire flows. So um, in the long run, they'll be better served uh, downstream of the booster station and. Uh, the tanks so that they have more pressure available for both domestic and fire flows. But they can be adequately served without the booster station based on the modeling that we did. Further questions? Questions? If not, thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you. Mr. Sewell? Welcome. Thank you. Mike Sewell with DR Horton, um, developer and builder out in Windermere and Windermere South. Um, just want to add some scheduling based on the Horton development and building that's going on out there. Getting approval tonight, we still have to grade, we still have to put pipes in the ground, we still have to build streets, we still have to put electric and telephone in and put the sidewalks in before we can even get to a point of talking building permits. And based on our schedule to build out the 125 lots, we're gonna be pushing right up into October to get to the point where we need permits. And then we can come back and visit with staff if the booster station for some reason isn't completed by the timeline that's in their contract. If it rains or something delays their contractor, we can come back and visit with staff and decide with the fire marshal and Mr. Kersky's group if it's okay to start houses out there with what we have for fire protection because it's going to still take us three, four months to build a home. Hmm. So we're, we're looking somewhere after January, February of next year before we actually have occupancy in there. So, so we feel good as a company with the schedule Mr. Adams has laid out and talking with Spock that we can get there. And by pushing or moving this development along, we'll get the pipes to where the area of the water tower is so the water tower can start next year. And then we can talk about all our land next year. Questions of the developer? Do you feel limited by Mr. Sewell, the, the utility not having that infrastructure in place. I mean, I understand your time schedule here, but uh, you know, the, the marketplace is, is red hot right now, a great opportunity. At, at times it, it constrains you, but we've been working closely with Spock here the last three, four, five months trying to 
get all the pieces in place and um, based on our last meeting, we'll get there. So we're, we're feeling good. I mean, it's always a struggle when you're out in a new area and, and this area, there's been a lot of pieces that we have to get, had to get figured out with staff, with county roads and water and sewer. So we're, we're working there. Hopefully this will be the last one that has pieces and parts that we have to get figured out and then we can just go back to a normal development pace and schedule. So we're getting close. Well, the West End is where our growth is. And Councilor Lehman? Mayor, when uh, Mr. Sewell said that next year, the next piece of land, the, is that next uh, phase serviced by the same elevation? It's, it'll, it'll probably more than likely, if we're fortunate to work a deal with a land seller and then work something through the city staff and your boards and you that you'd approve, it'd be somewhere out in that area. But where exactly, don't know. I mean, we still, there's sewers that have to get figured out. You know, we, we got to work in right. in line with what where the infrastructure is. So, but it would be somewhere out there in that elevation and it would be based off that. So we'd need the tower in place. And as Mr. Adams says, if he's going in 2020, we still we still have to develop it. So if the, build, if the tower's going up, Horton would feel comfortable about making an investment in additional lots out there. Other question, Councilor Whiting? No? no, that's good to hear. I'm glad you're working with public utilities and you're comfortable with that. And um, um, after that, I'd be comfortable with moving forward. I have one more question. Councilor Brennan? Um, at the last joint meeting that we had with um, Shakopee Public Utilities, they had indicated that um, you had spoken to them um, uh, regarding the trunk water charge and the water capacity charge, and, and they indicated that you're feeling comfortable with that. And, and I, I wanna see as, a, as, your, as your position as a developer, do you feel that, that the way that they're calculated are correct and, and you're, as a developer in general, are they in line with other communities in the area? It should come as no surprise to Joe, as because we've talked before about this, is that I believe and Horton believes that the connection fees are on the high side. We've gone, I showed him my calculations, and he has his logic on why he believes they're, they're good. I, I think he takes a conservative approach, and at our last meeting, he had indicated that he was going to talk with his commission about maybe doing a fee study for this area, and I think that's why we feel comfortable if he continues down that path to do a fee study. As we had discussed with um, your city administrator and Mr. Adams, all, all the lots in this area will pay for the booster station and water tower and wells, based on my calculation. Now, I'm not the utility commission, so I may be missing some numbers, so you'll have to rely on what Mr. Adams tells you. And he did point out that there's the wells in the existing high elevation one area that serves this area right now. And he's right, but we also didn't include any commercial or, or any industrial land north of 17. We just used residential. So it gets to be a pretty close wash. So I, I understand where his numbers come from, but I don't think he adequately includes any expansion areas to the south or west. So he, he, that's why I think he's taking a conservative approach and I just think their fees have gone up a little bit more than they need to be each year. And hopefully they will do their fee study here in the next six months to a year and we'll have a real answer on where things should be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sewell, that's an, I, I talked to that point the other night where the fees from your development were approaching, I don't know, $7 million or something. and. And then looking at the cost of the CIP on the utilities that, of the booster station and the tank, and I'm going, it looks like this area of the West End, of which you represent the growth area right now, but the West End all the way to 78, all the way around the curve to 169 is a big area. Um, it just seemed like the, a third of it, or your area is paying for the upfront infrastructure that we're now trying to get in place for no more development and you're right, then where does future development uh, fees go towards? And they said, well, that just goes for the next phase. And uh, uh, that was kind of the explanation, but uh, that's what I tried to bring up um, 
you know, pay, development pays for itself. I understand that, but it seems like Horton is funding a lot of the real heavy infrastructure <coughs> now, um, and how those other fees in those other areas to the west, to the little, the commercial to the north, and and, and to the west, I guess. Well, how do those fees factor into infrastructure that's going to serve that area? And, and, and we agree, and, it, and it's it's a philosophy that I can't give to the commission. It's got to come from their commissioner and whoever they get their input from. I think they're conservative, and and I I have enough history in Shakopee to understand where they are, how they got there. But I think they need to look at their how they raise their rates each year, and maybe not have the escalator that they've put in place the last however many years where they added on the top of the engineering news record, inflation rate. So I, I, I think I'd like the commission to look at that and I will continue to chirp at Mr. Adams and Mr. Crooks when I see them that if they're looking at the fee study, I, I think they're doing what they think is best for this city of Shockby residents, but I also look at if we can keep making homes affordable, because that, that's the struggle out there is, trying to figure out a way to get affordable. And I, and I know it's a, it's a big item in newspapers and the Builders Association came out with an affordability thing. And you can take that one way or the other, all depending on which side of the fence you start on. But there's some, there's some valid points in there. I don't know if they're all 100%, but we have to look at what's a fair number to charge. You, you're not charging me because it's just going on to the next resident that buys a home. And affordability is really getting a struggle. Just, just between Windermere and Windermere South, the same home's gone up $25,000. Some of that's labor, some of that's material, and some of that's fees. I mean, it's not all government fees, but it's gone up 25 grand here in the last year. So it's, 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 it's a struggle every day that we deal with. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, more discussion on this? Councilor Brennan? You no, um, I would like to make a motion to approve resolution number R2019-035, a resolution approving the final plat of Windermere South, second edition. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Lehman. Further discussion? Discussion? Discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Moving ahead thank then you. to 4B2, Councilor Lehman. Here, I took this one off because <laughs> lo and behold, I have the ins electrical inspector coming to my house tomorrow morning. You have an electrical inspection? Yeah. Um, I called this morning and they're coming tomorrow morning. I thought it was a pretty quick turnaround time actually, so kind of in the middle on this one. I could go either way. I, I just thought a little discussion on it would be good. Sway me one way or the other. <laughs> I think uh, I have discussed this with uh, Mr. Kursky, and um, we've used the same state inspector. Is it? So, Mayor and Council, this is not a state inspector. This is a contract inspector. He does not work for the state. He actually works for the city of Shakopee. And he all, works on commission. He's He's been on contract for 31 years, um, and he works on commission. So he gets a percentage of every electrical permit. So I think what we're trying to do here... Um, We've gotten large enough that our projects have gotten more complex, and we actually offer better service than that. So if you call in the morning, we'll usually have an inspector out there that same day. So we have, I would consider, probably one of the better inspection staffs in the region right now. Um, we've been able to bring on a lot of new blood. They've all gone through a lot of uh, up-to-date training, and our goal is on the electrical side to also send the electrical inspector who would meet the state standards to the building official course and get a limited building official license in June so that we don't have to send two inspectors, which is what's happening right now. So if you put an electric hot water heater in, the code requires an electrical inspector and a plumbing inspection. This person would be able to do both at the same time. And so the other thing we have not done, which I think <coughs> is a concern for myself and the building officials on the larger projects, they have pretty complex electrical plans. No one ever looks at those plans. So we have to rely on the professionals. I can tell you, we look at all the other plans. So plumbing, um, 
structural, um, mechanical all get looked at and we find lots of errors. And so this will give us, I think, another level of customer service to look at plans as they come in. The other thing is right now, all of the electrical permits, because it's an outside contractor, are all handled um, by hand. And um, our goal is to get this in our electrical permit on the electronic side so that all of our permits will be electronic and all handled through one source. So right now you actually have to call the electrical inspection inspector to schedule your appointment um, versus we'll be able to see where it is and whether it's ready for an electrical permit because our inspectors have become pretty thorough at tracking where we are in the process. So if it's not ready for an electrical inspection, you're, we're going to know. More questions, Councilor Lehman? Is the, uh, <clears throat> is the electrical inspection process a state oversight process? Mayor and Council of the State oversees all of our inspectors. So all of our um, building inspector, ins our building official and our building inspectors are all state licensed. So they have to pass the state test just like the electrical oh. inspector. Okay, so my second question to that is, the, see my furnace went out and then when the company came in and put my furnace in, they had another company come in and do the wiring part of it. And that, per that company had to be state certified electric people. And then the <clears throat> state certified electrical inspector is gonna come back and inspect the state certified electricians work. It's like, if it's a certified state electrical contractor person doing the work, why does the state have to double check themselves? They don't trust themselves, obviously. Because so mayor, mayor, mayor and council and contractors make mistakes. And I can tell you right now, I'll tell you a really quick story. So since we've been upgrading kind of the way we do business, all of our inspectors wear um, CO2, carbon monoxide and CO2 ins badges. And they've been in properties where people have been working inside that are all licensed and where it's been over 100 parts, which will kill you. And so they've had to tell the soups on those jobs, you're going to not only kill other inspector, you're going to kill all your staff. So while people may be licensed and have passed a test, it doesn't necessarily mean on the job they're doing everything 100% the way they should be. One of the things we found recently, and the state is now pursuing that contractor, is people were coming in for gas hot water heaters individually. So Councilmember Lehman, you would come in and take a permit out. And so we saw a trend that people were doing that and you're probably not installing your own, uh, own gas line. Well, gas, as most of you know, is a pretty dangerous thing. They were having non-state certified um, people installing them and were having to fail those water heaters. And so the state is now pursuing that contractor. So even though they're a licensed mechanical contractor, being able to install a gas line does not it's a different permit, a different license for a very good reason. So I think we have seen with the hot economy that we have right now, there's a lot of people that for whatever reason are you know, in a hurry to get things done or just not necessarily doing it the right way. And so I think it's incumbent upon the community to protect our citizens and make sure that whatever they're paying for, be it an electrical outlet, a meter, a gas out water heater, a furnace, that it gets installed properly and works. So if the state certified electrical guy or company might make a mistake, what's to say that the state certified inspector doesn't make a mistake? So, well, I don't think, if, if I may, I don't think there's anything that's saying that at all. I think what you're saying is that you have another set of eyes that is reviewing things to try to make it as safe as possible. People make mistakes. It happens. Yeah. And Mayor and Council, I'll tell you, we had a pretty reputable old time um, contractor that said, oh, I like the current inspector or whatever. And I had to say to them, well, on another project, you almost got killed because people make mistakes. And so our goal is to minimize that as much as possible. And I think the system we have right now where it's basically a commission basis and if we're not going to give you another commission to go out and look at something, you're going to say to somebody, well, you're going to fix it, right? Because I'm not coming back because I'm not getting paid. We sometimes visit projects six, seven, eight, ten times to make sure that whatever is done is done correctly. We have shut down projects because we had a house recently that someone didn't take any permits out and actually an engineer turned them in because they said, I don't want to get sued and they're not doing this properly and it's not getting inspected. So we sent someone out, shut that job down and sure enough, the whole house would have collapsed. And 
Probably wouldn't happen until we got a lot of snow because you as a buyer would have gone, it looks good, but because it had all been covered up. But we were able to find that there were some major structural problems in the house and shut that project down, got them to take permits, got all the inspections so that whoever bought that house buys something that actually will last. Councilor Whiting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I'm, you know, I'm just kind of putting out there a possibility, but our future potential inspector could make a mistake too. Um, but the situation we have now with a, a contracted electrical inspector, we don't have a position of accountability where we could get the retraining for that state inspector or uh, you know, if something's caught or, or have the ability to, to do anything about any issue or even making sure that the inspection was done properly. With a employee in house, we have some you know, general accountability issues with, with that person and how he does his job. And I, I, I like to, I think we're in a better position with that. And Mayor and Council, the other thing I tell you is there was just a memo sent out by the Department of Labor and Industry with all the potential flooding that's coming in various communities. And we had a flood of a business here recently. We don't have the capacity right now to go out and we're supposed to be certifying that business can reopen. We can't do that and that inspector wasn't around. If that had happened and we had a person on staff, they would have gotten called in, they would have inspected all that electrical work that got flooded and either said, look, you gotta do some repairs or it's certified. We don't have that capacity right now. And that was a very public business that should have been inspected. In talking to Mr. Kursky about this uh, earlier, we. I think, you know, we talk about mistakes in that. Actually, I look at it the other way by having an in-house person. Uh, we might get some value add here a little bit. Uh, you know, part of our building department, uh, he might take on some other duties that wouldn't be like that state contractor, I guess, if I'm terming that right. So I look at the opportunity and say value add, um, in-house local, um, that's kind of how my basis is. Um, Councilor Lehman. Well, I think you have to weigh, okay, we're paying a contractor, whatever percentage or something, uh, we're paying them this much, but our overhead for that person is nothing. Mm. You bring somebody in, you've got wages, training, um, you know, all the be benefits package and stuff, and that's a dollar amount that escalates every year with the COLA, and what does that do to the affordability side of it of what you're actually charging? You know, and where does that play out in the scheme of things too, so. Okay. And Mayor and Council, I say inspections have been pretty robust and have put a lot of money back into the general fund over the past couple of years. This electrical inspector that's currently under contract took in $80,000 for January, February, and March, and the city got another $24,000 on top of that. Um, this position with all the full benefit loads, about $100,000 a year, I think between permits and right sizing the permits, we've looked at all the other cities that are doing it. We're a little low right now, and I think working on percentage, we're gonna, we've been paying that price. That from right now, it's $136 for a single family home for three inspections, and we take 30% of that. I think um, most of the cities are at $175 for a single family home and it's on limited inspections. And I think that's really what our goal is. If there's a problem, our person shouldn't have to worry about working on a commission. They should be able to go back to that house two times, three times, five times, 10 times, whatever it takes to make sure it's done properly. And I think that the building permit side um, has been pretty robust and I think that we'll be able to cover this position without any issues. Well, what does it do to the end user? I mean, if somebody gets a simple permit, not for a house, but a, just a simple electrical permit cost today to after this is done. So, so Mayor and Council, we actually pulled the fees off so we can give you a comparison, but right now it's about 50 bucks if you do a garage or something smaller, a basement finish, it'll be about $56 when we're done. A single family home is about $136, it'll be $175, but it won't be, you won't be limited to two visits. It'll be as many as it takes to make sure the house is properly inspected. Um, what would that inspected. garage cost be under this proposal? $50, that's exactly what that it is today. Small projects Yep, change. small projects won't change. We're gonna propose to you and you'll see it April 2nd. 
On the larger projects, it'll be a sliding scale. The larger they are, the percentage will go down. But right now, literally, there's a checklist. We charge by the circuit breaker. We charge by how many amps you're getting installed. It goes on and on and on. And we're trying to go to a much simpler formula. So if it's a house, it's 176 bucks or 175 bucks, and you're done. If it's a garage, it's 50 bucks, and you're done. Or if it's a basement finish, it's 50 bucks, and you're done. I think it's the commercial projects, which have been much more complex, that you know, we literally charge by the outlet and the other stuff. It'll be a percentage, and we'll have to sit and have someone go out and count all the outlets and breakers. Councilor Whiting? Yeah, from the memo, it looks like uh, an average of $108,000 was collected per year for our state inspector or, or contract, contract inspector. Contract inspector. Yep. And that's 100% pass through. We don't collect, a, do we collect a little bit off of that? So, um, Mayor and Council, we get 30%. So, the 108000 he's taken home about 80 some odd thousand, and we're getting the difference. So, January, February, March, he took home about $80,000, and the city got about 24000 so that's kind of a, it can be an up or down. Depending Mayor and Council is correct. It depends on the projects and, and what's coming in. We had the BHS project come through and one of the apartment buildings and that, you know, apartment building under our current rates is about sixteen seventeen thousand dollars um, in fees. And I think that this is going to provide, I mean, I'm used to, in most cities, the inspector, when they come out, they check every single outlet, they check all your GFIs, they check every single breaker. I can tell you, based on the current fee structure we have and support we have, it just it's not economically feasible for the person to do that. So it, it, kind of going back to what Councillor Lehman was talking about, uh, if we have a on-staff electrical inspector, is there a potential that this person could take some other classes and, and do some of the other inspections? Mayor and Council, one of the requirements of this position, and we got the state to approve it um, today, is that they will also in June go and get their state certification as a limited building official. So the difference is a building official is like Dave Kriesel, who's our building official. The, all the other rest of our inspectors have what's considered a limited license, so they can't be the building official until they pass another test. But we would require them to take that test so we can do that dual inspection. I mean, some of our newer inspectors have gone out and said, you know, we go out and do a framing inspection and then the plumber and electrician come along and they're drilling through all the stuff not in the right places. We're going to be able to have kind of a backstop to that now and kind of go, look, you may have passed the framing inspection, but the electrical inspector said you drilled through all the joists. Further questions of staff? If not, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Councillor Lehman? Yes, sir. Pulled this off? I did. All right, would you like to make a motion? Uh, no, I'm going to pass on making a motion. All right, Councilor Whiting. A motion to approve the position of a building inspector electrical in the building inspection division and planning development. I'd like to second that. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Contreras. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving ahead then to 4D2, Councilor Lehman. Fourth Avenue Trail Project. Let's see here. 4D2. Oh. oh, yeah. Eminent domain. Obviously, I'm not going to support taking property by force for a trail. I can't uh, vote against it if it's on consent. But I will ask a couple questions. Um, how wide is this road right away that currently exists? Roadway? Right the road is right away. This is uh, for a trail. Steve, when you're ready. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, as we speak, if I can delay a second, I'm measuring. One of the things to, to point out is that this property that we're talking about is already encumbered. We already have easements on it. We just don't have a trail easement on it. So uh, as you know, we have different types of easements. Uh, but the area that we're looking at, uh, I believe we have storm sewer and well, I'm not sure what else is, what other easements are on it. But um, so mayor and council members, it's actually, it's approximately 60 feet um, on, the, on the main portion of 12th Avenue. Um, and to add what Mr. Reynolds indicated, <clears throat> um, the area actually outside of the city right away 
uh, the majority of that area um, is already encumbered by a drainage and utility easement. And within that easement, typically we have easement there, but it's, uh, it mostly exists for private utilities beyond the property line. In this case, um, the water main is within this easement as well as a sanitary sewer. So that, that private property portion beyond the right of way is, is actually already encumbered um, pretty substantially. Um, typically, um, Shakopee Public Utilities has the caveat that you shall not plant trees in that DNU easement above our water main. Um, and likewise with the sanitary sewer, we prefer that uh, not to happen as well. Obviously there's landscaping in this area. Um, um, it's there, we don't plan on removing it at this point, but we, we do want it to manage it properly. So the point is, is that that area is substantially already encumbered except on the east end for like the FedEx property, which then, the, then those utilities are within the roadway. Um, so that answers the, the, the 60 feet question approximately. Can we put it on the other side of the street? Uh, Mayor and council members, um, that's a four lane roadway and it, uh, approximately again, um, there's from the edge of the curb to the right of way line, it's, it's not adequate to barely even put a sidewalk in there. So from the back of the curb to the right of way line, we're looking at seven feet, six feet, we have a 10 foot wide trail, so it's, it's impossible to build a sidewalk or a trail along 12th Avenue without acquiring easement. So why don't you make a sidewalk instead of a trail since the sidewalk is narrower? Very good question. Um, Mayor and council members, um, this, so, so why not? Um, how about if I, talk about why a trail first. So, so this corridor was identified for a regional trail connection. Um, it, it's a continuance of the, the 12th Avenue trail to the west, west of County Road 83, and it connects up with a regional trail um, that is stubbed out to, to Gateway and 12th Avenue um, that connects with, with Quarry Park. Um, so it's looked at as a regional corridor uh, so that, that is why there's a trail planned here. Could it be a sidewalk? It could, but not under the hat of this project at this point. Um, we, we received a grant for $150,000. That's, that's a grant that was received for a regional trail, 10 foot wide trail. Um, so to change gears at this point, um, it, it'd be tough. And, and actually it, it'd be, so that would be a sidewalk that would be right on the back of the curb that is right next to um, a four lane roadway. So it's not the safest location for, for sidewalks. Do we have them in town? Avenue. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we have them in town, um, but, it, but it's not a preferred. Well, if it was a regional trail in the plan for a period of time, you would think that as these properties were platted out that the easement would have been acquired in each plat. Apparently we, we missed that part. Uh, Mayor and Council Members, if I, if I can comment on that, I, I would indicate that that it wasn't necessarily missed. Um, there's some undeveloped properties. Um, so, so the city did acquire some and on others, um, I don't know the exact timing of it, but, but certainly uh, we, have, we have eight easements out of the 20 we need. We have 12 remaining. Um, so uh, there, there is additional easement work that's needed. I'm surprised that uh kind of a business corridor here that, uh, you know, more businesses wouldn't be wanting to do this because of lunch breaks, go for a walk instead of get in the automobile, a better opportunity to, to be outside and walk. There is, uh, this whole area is void of sidewalk or trail. Um, you know, in today's life cycle things, I, but um, I think you have made some progress on this, Councilor Layman. Mayor, I would much rather see us go down a path of allowing these property owners the time to uh, get their own appraisals for the, the property that question and compare it to what our appraisals are, negotiate individually and get this worked out without taking property by force. Okay. Um, that, that, that would be my per, first preference. Steve? Um, Mayor and council members, that that is Absolutely, um, our first preference as well. Um, to keep a project on schedule, I, I, I would like to give a little background if I may. Um, so, um, 
Point number one would be, this is a parallel path. Uh, the, we, we are going down parallel. We, we have, I, I have appraisals in front of me here, but you know, that, that should be kept confidential at this point. So we have amounts. Um, the amounts range for the temporary easement as well as the permanent easement for these 12 different properties. They range from $4,600 that was done by a certified appraiser um, up to uh, um, just under $30,000. Um, so uh, we, we do plan on going the route that Councilmember Lehman that you just indicated. Uh, we we want to partner with the property owners. That's why we hired um, Henning professionals to help us with this and to directly negotiate and, and hopefully um, that all these property owners uh, do accept um, uh, the offer um, that I'm asking you to authorize us to make tonight. Um, but if, if they... Uh, if, if they don't just simply accept that, and, and the city attorney can talk more on this as well, um, there is a process to do their own appraisal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if after all of that still does not, not um, come into alignment with what, what a fair value is, there is that the final eminent domain that is a parallel path here that we're going on. And I, and I would like to, to make one more point and then let the city attorney talk a little bit about that, that eminent domain part of it. Um, so this is, I pull up to make sure I'm quoting the right amount. So this is a, it's estimated at about a $1.1 million project. So to date, so, so you know, to date, um, the engineering of the project is, is generally complete. Um, that, that's in the tune of approximately $130,000 that has been spent already on the engineering of this trail. Um, and to deliver those plans that, are, that we're ready to get final approval from MnDOT and, and go forward with bidding on it. Um, so that's $130,000. Um, we, we also hired, um, under the, the council's approval, we hired Henning Professional Services in the amount of just under $100,000 to assist us with this, uh, with the easement acquisition. Um, so a, a big majority of that work has been done as well. So we've already encumbered about $200,000 um, of engineering admin um, and legal fees on this project at this point. So I wanted to, to make, make, make you aware of that. Um, and, and then another point I would like to make um, that city attorney and I were just talking about would be our goal is to, to work with our partners and property owners. Initially it was, will you please dedicate all these easements? That didn't happen. Next step is, okay, we would like to uh, uh, continue and, and give you a fair market value for those already areas that are encumbered by sanitary and water main, et cetera. Um, so that's where we're heading right now. So fast forward, uh, we need 12 more easements. If we only have one property owner that we're unable to get the easement on, that basically prohibits us from moving forward with this project at all. We, we, uh, we shouldn't even go forward in bidding it. If, if we don't have commitment from the council tonight, we should absolutely not bid this project. It's not fair to contractors. It's, it's, it's kind of a waste of money if we don't have that commitment to go forward with, that, that project, with the project. Um, so, I, so I do ask consideration of those points. Thank you. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, whenever, whenever I put something over top of an easement or a drainage ditch or a pipe or something, or like a fence, I'm told, hey, if the city has to have access to it, they're gonna rip your stuff down and that's on you to pay for the repair of your, your stuff. Why do we not have the same for a trail on top of an existing sewer, stormwater, whatever, whatever's already there? Why don't we put the trail right on top of it? It's already an easement. We wouldn't have to acquire it. And if they have to enter the pipe for some reason, they can tear up our trail and we'll just replace that section of trail. Uh, Mayor and council, member, uh, council members, um, you sound like our city administrator. He asked me the same question. We already have- I haven't talked to him about this. No, just good we, minds. We already like. have drainage and utility easement. Steve, why can't we put a trail there? We already have easement. Well, the answer is, and I consulted with the city attorney a while back, um, we, we do not have the rights to put a trail in a drainage and utility easement. Unfortunately, doesn't seem intuitive about it, but we do not have the rights to do that, unfortunately, in this case. If it's a utility easement, does Buck have the right to put a trail in their utility easement? No? Sa same rules apply. Okay. I'll jump in, yeah. Council Member Lehman and, and Mayor and Council. Um, 
you only have the right to use an easement for what, what the easement says you can use it for. In this case, you have drainage and utility easements. Um, you can't use those for, for right-of-way, for trail, for anything other than uh, utility purposes. And um, so essentially you need uh, additional property rights in order to do that, um, specifically a trail easement or a right-of-way easement. Mr. Reynolds? But to be clear, we are talking about the same piece of property. <laughs> it quite literally will have that easement here and then have that other easement on top. can't have the cap on top because it's designed for an easement of, of specific purpose. And uh, but that's an, uh, it's an ironic twist of, of things when you have an easement that... I don't understand why the property owner would say, I can't use this strip because there's pipes or drainage easements there. I currently can't use it. So, Pay me no, so if there's a, something else on top of something I can't currently use, I'm not out anything. I'd like to get paid for that. That's what well, I can get paid for that. That's the answer. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> this is part of the process. Take, it doesn't take eminent domain to get paid for that. You it, just well, merely that's say, always I accept in these your contracts. Offer. All right. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're tr right. right. Councilor Whiting? That's what I wanted to say is that this is part of the process. Uh, you ask them, and then you go through with the offer portion of it. Eminent domain's floating out there, and the people want the check. And uh, they, if they don't think the check is big enough, they can get their own assessment. But I assure you, uh, my guess, uh, this will get everybody will take that check eventually. You know, it might take a process, but uh, uh, I, it'll it'll move on. And that's by design. And we've gone through this on other projects uh, of the same type. And one one other comment too that I'll add is um, the first step that would happen if if the council approves the resolution as presented tonight is that. Um, there's at least about a 30-day window where the city is going to make offers, um, present appraisals to these property owners. Um, so there is a period of, of direct negotiation. You don't jump right to eminent domain. Um, you, you attempt to work with them and see what can happen in that in that 30 to 45-day window. Councilor Lehman? So why wouldn't the first step being to direct staff to work with these property owners and do this and come back at the next meeting if it's not successful with this second step? Uh, one, one reason is um, that it slows things down. I know from a timing perspective, there's grant money out there that the city, um, it's my understanding, may not get if it doesn't move on this quickly. Um, uh, you certainly can. Um, decide not to authorize the eminent domain portion tonight and come back to that later. Um, but if you don't authorize it, a property owner might not have any reason to talk to you because they know, they might very well know that you don't have the authority, at least at this point, to use eminent domain. So they could choose not the to. Bureaucracy to goes on. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Brennan? Could you tell me, if, does a trail improve a property and so it improves the value of the property? Um, I'm mayor and council members. Um, so in, in this case and in many cases, um, I would say if you did a, an assessment or an appraisal of a property pre and post a regional trail, more times than not, it's going to add value to that property. Um, there's a lot of NIMBY with trails, um, especially in residential neighborhoods. I don't want the trail. I've never had one. I don't want it. But if that trail was already in place, you would really see the value to these properties and, and, it, and it is experienced. So this is in a, a strictly commercial retail industrial area. Um, I absolutely think it will add value to every single one of these properties, including the properties on the north side and in a wider area out because all of these employees are wanting this trail. They want this. That's, that's why we are talking about it now rather than in 2020. We, the city council advanced this project um, um, because of that reason, because the employees, um, the people that work out there, they wanted this trail. Um, thank you. Uh, Councilor Contreras? Um, after this discussion and understanding that um, value will you know, go up and, I mean, everything seems to be in, in the correct situation and we won't go into imminent domain until everything you know, has been spoken to, I'd like to um, make a motion to approve the resolution R2. 019-018 uh, authorizing approval of appraised values, um, off offers of compensation and acquisition of eminent domain for 12th Avenue Trail Project CIF-20-003. I have a motion on the table and a second by Councilor Whiting for their discussion. Discussion? Discussion? 
All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes four to one. Great discussion, thank you. All right, that ends our six uh, business removed from consent. We will move ahead then to a public hearing, a 7A vacation of alley right-of-ways. Uh, motion, Councilor uh, Lehman. Motion to open a public hearing. Second. I have a motion a second to open the public hearing. Further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Public hearing is now open. Uh, Michael will present. Welcome back. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is a vacation of the right-of-way um, in Block 5 of the East Shakopee Platte. You can see from the aerial photograph that these alleys are not used, and in fact, they are encumbered. Um, in particularly this location today, um, and it's not wide enough to actually be an alley. This is also not used except by utilities. <laughs> so in working with engineering and the public utilities, they agree this really doesn't serve any purpose anymore. The individual on this lot would like to work with his neighbors and acquire some of this so he can get additional access. But again, by um, policy, this will we have notified all these property owners and they will get half of the right of way over to them and then it will be up to this individual to try and work with them. But we will be abandoning our rights to the alley. Michael, so one property owner asked for this entire vacation, but it, the property will be sp spread equally to the adjacent property owners. Mayor, Mayor and Council, that's correct. Everybody gets and half. And then if the easement is vacated and the applicant said, well, he wants to gain additional access. How would he do that? So if Mayor and Council, um, so if you look at this particular area, so this would now be cut down the middle. And so there would be, this person will get half, this person will get half, this person will get half, and the applicant will get half. It would be up to him to try and acquire the rest of these three pieces. Again, there will be a utility easement that will remain for Spuck through here, but we're, we're getting rid of it because it doesn't really serve any public purpose anymore. Um, so whether he can acquire it or not, it's in our best interest to basically uh, abandon this right away. And that's all up to him. And But if there's yeah, an easement correct. in there in utilities, we just learned you can't put a cap on it, right? <laughs> Mayor and Council, that's correct. So there will be a recorded easement from Spuck for the um, power line that runs down here. Right. Councilor Whiting. I live... Uh, uh, Couple blocks away, and the gas line runs down the alley. Is the gas lines in this portion of the? So, so Mayor and Council, any utilities they were notified, but we haven't heard. But any utilities that are in here will remain and will have an easement. So there may be other utilities that run in this area. And before we do that abandonment, we will record those easements. Okay, Councilor Layman. Mayor, I've got a question, and see if I can staff can understand what I'm asking. The the portion from Minnesota Street. Let's see here, you got that backward for me. Um, from Minnesota Street West, moving west, yep. I'm gonna do a hypothetical and you tell me if this is possible or not. So it gets all split up amongst all the properties and then the four properties all agree to make a shared drive for access to all four properties. Would all four of them properties then have to be re, uh, what do you call it, when they document that shared drive? So, so Mayor and Council, we will, as we have on other ones that we've abandoned, the city will prepare deeds that will give it back, these pieces, to each of these lots, and then they would have to come up with their own easement for a joint access agreement, which we have all over town. Okay. Then they, would they have to record that? Right. Are you saying that? Yeah. Ma so Mayor then and Council, that. sold, you're, you're, you're buying this agreement. Right. All right, Council? So recorded? Yes, okay. so, so Mayor and Council, they'll get these deeded back, and then if they want a joint access agreement, they'd have to come up with that and record it. And then I have a last question to that. If that would be the scenario, and I don't know that, I'm just making this up, would signage saying private drive be the responsibility of the property owners and not the city at that point? I'll leave that question to the city engineer. Uh, Private. Um, Mayor and Council Members, I'm um, um, certainly that would be um, a private drive and their responsibility. Um, it's interesting because if they all wanted to use it, we should they should just petition the city to build an alley. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we 
I don't know that. I'm just right. So we <laughs> we put the prescription that if indeed they you know we don't want to stand in the way. We no one's petitioned us to build an alley. So at a minimum, you must. Uh, so th this falls back to the county. This this property, if we vacate it, goes to the county, and they deal with the county on splitting it and all of that. Um, but we made the prescription to maintain a, a drainage and utility easement over this area to to protect the drainage rights as well as all the private u utilities. So uh, I, I didn't answer your question directly, but um, I scratched my head a little bit on it too. Let me hit it again. So, if it was a private driveway, they'd have to put their own sign up saying it's a private drive. We wouldn't be doing that. We we would not be doing that. Okay. No, that's the easy answer. Uh, the city, do, you know, other than the city not wanting to have to plow it as an alley, um, it's already planted as an alley. So if they petitioned for an alley, it could be run as the same. I mean, we'd have to discuss it again and, and go through the motions and approve it, but. Uh, pay for it. And pay for it. Pay for it. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's what I was getting at. But uh, it's got no outlet. Uh, it's got no outlet. It's, it's, hard it's no out. outlet. It's not a. It's not a, a value to the city as an alley. And uh, uh, but that's an opportunity that's out there. And, and Mayor and Council, you'll notice these two houses in particular have access off the front, as and this house has access off the sides. So true, true. It, there's really no reason. Or this, I have dual access. I mean, it happens all over town. You know, you, right. Mayor and Council, this is true. But so this. This property owner has talked to the other property owners. They were all notified as part of this process. Nobody called up and said, hey, I want an alley. I mean, they're all aware of this. And they're all aware they would get, as Mr. Lilhog mentioned, they'll all get through this abandonment process part of that alley. Uh, more questions of staff? More questions of staff? If not, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. Would the applicant uh, like to come forward and make comment on this? Please come forward. We've got to have your name and address for the record. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Jack Hurst. I am the owner of 726 Third Avenue East, which is the property that he uh, acknowledged. I have already received um, notarized deeds from two of the three properties involved. So my intent is to acquire all of that space um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them, uh, you can still see my ice rink is half melted. And when I have the ice rink up, my dog kind of gets smashed into a small spot. So just having more area for my dog to run, throw his ball, those kind of things. I would also like access to the rear of my property. So I don't have any intern or any plans to put up any driveway or anything like that. But the occasional load of wood, um, a little trailer full of mulch, that kind of stuff. Right now I go all the way in front of my property and have to come all the way back around over and over again. So um, I've talked to Spuck about the easement. I hopefully when I get my third neighbor to sign and notarize everything, I plan on um, putting a fence up and the spec has informed me that I need a 12 foot un unlocked gate so they would have access to the utility poles. One of the utility poles is right behind my garage so I know exactly where they need to go. Questions of the applicant? Questions of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you guys. This is a public hearing. Would anybody else like to come forward and make comment on this proposed vacation? This is a public hearing. Anybody else like to come forward and make comment on this uh, proposal? Vacation? Seeing none. Culture Whiting. I move to close the public hearing. Second. second. I have a motion and a couple seconds from <laughs> Councilor Brennan. Uh, further discussion? Discussion, discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. Public hearing is closed, Councilor Whiting. Is there any reason why we'd want to keep this, Mr. Lillehong? Um, Mayor and council members, uh, just preserve the drainage and utility easement and rights and that's it. Other than that, we, we don't need it unless someone were to petition us to build an alley, that's it. So no. I think we cleaned up some property here just uh, to the south here in this area a couple of times, some little triangles, some railroad, old railroad bed areas, uh, some houses were built on the, on the excess uh, years ago. So um, I look at this as a cleanup and unless I hear from the city that we still need this for a specific purpose. Councilor Lehman. 
We want for resolution R2019-036, resolution appro approving the vacation of all alley rights away located in Block 5 E Shakopee with the understanding in the resolution that all the drainage and utility easements are gonna um, be conveyed and the, now yeah, as described in the resolution. I'll second. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Brennan. Further discussion? Discussion? Discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Aye, those opposed, motion passes, thank you. Moving ahead then to 8A1 monthly financial review, February 2019. Darren, welcome. Like somebody was cleaning up A little the desktop. technical. <laughs> Oh, that's the wrong one. I'll grab the other The one. city is in good standing here. The numbers are great. We're just waiting for the first allocation of tax payments in May. Um, you don't even need me. Community center <laughs> revenue is doing pretty well. Um, looking for some additional um, money coming in from the ICE rental. Um, February 102. I don't see it. I'd like to talk to you about the mayor and council. Uh, looks like we have some dip there, but those are all due to association and dues that are due in the first part of the year. Uh, one uh, thing I could I, I could comment on while we're waiting, Mr. Mayor and members yes. of council, uh, we probably need to sit down and uh, talk about some of the ideas that we have for the mm -hmm. community center and ice arena when it comes to revenues. Uh, we've got a lot of good things that uh, uh, Mr. Tobin is uh, bringing forward and discussions with the community for some of that private-public partnership piece as well as uh, some innovative uh, uh, revenue generation uh, ideas. So uh, in the next couple months, I'll, I'll sit down with him and we'll bring some of those ideas forward. Some of them are just ideas. Some of them are, are, are you know, very much not in any type of planning stage whatsoever. But it'll kind of give you an idea of the panoply of uh, things that we're looking at when it comes to revenues for both of those facilities. Yep. Okay. That would be great. Thank you, Darren, for your presentation tonight. I do appreciate it. <laughs> 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 Councilor Lehman? I just had one question, Mayor, on uh, 66 natural resources, 25%. Um, yep. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, I believe that is, um, so we had a tree contract, I think, done. I think I saw at Memorial Park there was actually tree work being done. Um, if you recall from last year, we didn't, uh, we didn't accept a bid last year because it was too high. We deemed it too too high, so we didn't actually utilize a lot of those dollars. So we, um, I think we rebid those, and maybe Mr. Lillock can speak more to that. But um, it looks like we're out contracting now to, for tree services in the winter time, which is the time to trim trees, obviously. One of them all hit, one hit all at once type deal. Okay. Any other? I have some questions. Of course, we've had uh, almost 80 inches of snow and a. So snow and melting and flooding, and um, it looks like we got a memo from Bill Reynolds a week ago about possible expenses, or maybe that was from Steve. Um, that'll affect street maintenance, and when will we expect that? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at street maintenance here, which is 42, or Division 42, you can see the, the year-to-date year -date expenditures are just over $400,000, $401,000. And if you compare that to last year, at the same time, it was $296,000, so that's a direct effect of, of right. our, our salt needs, our plowing over time, yeah. fuel usage, those types of things on that end of it and such. And so it, it obviously falls within the, our current budget parameters at the moment. Um, you know, we'll knock on wood and hope for a, a good fall and early winter next year. Tomorrow's spring, so we don't need it, any more it's, it's all good from here. All good from here. Don't forget that Herded, our budget hurt. cycle hits two different winters, and we're just finishing <laughs> the first one, and we'll hit the <coughs> beginning a, of the... Save a few shekels for next fall. <laughs> Hopefully it's a mild at least till December. Well, we've got to wait and see what the flood costs are. No. Well, and that's also a piece right, of it, right. because we've got some overtime there as well. Right. Culture whining? No, I just wanted to mention that... Uh, we may be good on that, but uh, is that something that we're still going to be purchasing uh, salt for next year on? When, when does that contract come up? I would assume so. I assume Mr. Lillahog can help See, us on that. We talked about it at a meeting or two before that we can still buy under the previous contract rather than go to the spot market. Um, correct, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we've already used, uh, we've already purchased our allotment for this year for salt. 
Um, so we're going to be trying to purchase more under that, that same contract for, for the fall and winter of 2019 here. Um, understanding that we would overrun our budget, but it's it's uh, the most prudent price to purchase salt with in the, in the best contract. Um, but we will be in the streets department. Um, we will be um, looking at ways to reduce budget with other things while while still maintaining and deliver those same services. So some more to come. And we'll definitely when we look at the start the 2019 budget process, we always we obviously take a look at the 2018 budget to see where we're at as well then too, and uh, that may be the recommendation then. And, to maybe come back and, and, and see where it's at. And, and maybe if there is a need to, to request more dollars or a shift of dollars there, that would be the time that we would we would do that, so this fall. So if you look at your expenditures overall, you're at 14%. Um, through two months, you've been at about 17%, so we're trending in a, in a good direction there. So um, all good on that end of it. Revenue side of it, licenses and permits, um, you're at 30% of budget, you know, you're through two months, so you're you're doubling the, the pace of pace of play there again. And, and we increased that, that budget allotment um, for 2019. And it's to a point where I get nervous about that because they need downturn in the economy and, um, and there it goes. But um, so far, knock on wood, we're, we're heading in the right direction there as well too, so. And we're not even in a real peak season yet for that as well. Right, right. Anything else on this before I move to the Our community shoes. center? Hey, Serena. No, sir. No, I think we're good. Okay. Over to the community center. So if you looked at last month, I had mentioned that we had, for 2018, we had started separating the, the Sand Venture, Ice Arena, and Community Center. In the, in the past, Sand Venture and the Community Center had been combined. Now we have them separated. I have one caveat to that is that we started that at the beginning of 2018, and we, we had some personnel services that didn't get changed over right at, the, at January 1st. We didn't uh, make that change until February or so, and then we did a journal entry in March to, to move that community center activity to the community center from the Sand Venture activity code. So for this month only, um, it looks better next month. Um, they, the wages and benefits and a lot of the operating expenditures for Sand Venture need to be combined with the community center uh, portion of that. So. That's the one caveat there. Um, if you look at their expenditures, uh, they are, you know, 13, I think the ice arena is 13% um, or 12% of expenditures today. So that's under that 17% under that kind of target that we're looking for for the end of February. And I think the community center is about 13.5%. Um, both the operational expenditures for the ice arena and the community center are a little bit higher than last year. And again, that's a timing deal. We had paid um, a natural gas bill in February 2019, and we paid that same bill last year in March of 2019. So um, just a couple days hit or miss of taking a snapshot in time of your financial report um, can make some changes kind of look um, out of place or whatnot, especially early in the year when there's limited revenues and expenditures. But um, everything is tracking to the way it, it should and is projected to go and is looking positive at this point. So anything there? On San Venture? Or any of them? On any of those three? I just uh, saw the timing of the revenue for the ice arena. The difference, we just received the larger, uh, bigger hunk of the rent for the from the school district or the hockey association? Um, that I'm sure that's probably what it is. It could have been... Um, I think we billed earlier the, the second half of the school district revenue this year compared to last year. I think we got in a little bit later there just due to uh, timing issues and personnel issues, I believe, on that end of it. So um, that's in, in place and, and paid already on that end of it. So, which is good because that season ends, um, high school season ends the end of February. So it's good to get that, that payment in there to match up with the timing of the expense, so. Councilor Lehman. If I'm reading this right, the uh Revenue for the community center went up to roughly twenty-five thousand, but the wages and benefits went up forty thousand. So you got to spend forty to make twenty-five. Government, right, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a timing thing as well too. Um, it, it's hard to say exactly when your expenditures, if you're higher or lower, um, at, at any point one in, in time on that end of it, and with your revenues, we'll have 
Um, as our spring and summer brochure comes out, we'll have a spike in revenues as those come through as well in too. Um, but uh, yeah, and not, you know, they're following in line with where the budget's at. So uh, it's just a matter of timing at this point, well, so. Let me ask you this, is wages and benefits, does that cover snow removal on that property? Is that charged back? That's in the facilities, it's in the, it, it's not in this community center part, that's in the facilities division with under, under parks or under recreation. The uh, mayor and council members, the, the most of the snow removal is done by public, public works, works. Okay. but then also the, there's a lot of it that's done on the sidewalks that's done by the maintenance crew there. So the big parking lots, and I don't know that there's I any separation. We, yeah, we don't charge that back right. necessarily. Okay. So, similar to other city facilities. More questions of Darren? So actually, Mr. or Council Member Lehman, if you look at the ex wages and ex expenditures for the community center, um, if you combine the 116 with the, the 20,000 up here from San Venture in 2018, that'll get you the 136. Um, it's a little closer to this year. Obviously, it's still under from whatever it was uh, compared this year to last or this year to last year, but it's a little bit closer there anyway. So now it's separated, but before it wasn't? Between Correct. In the past community center and San Venture, those operations were combined into one. 165, okay. That narrows it a little bit. Good to see that deferred revenue on the memberships continue to hold. It's up a little bit, but steady. Yeah, and that was, remember, at the end of the year, at December there, we saw a little dip in that. Um, it dipped down a little bit, and we were wanted to keep an eye on that. And now it's it's both January and February. It's kind of come back in line with where the the previous years were at. So that's a month by month number. So that it's for, uh, so there must be a lot of renewals or something in right in December. Well, there was probably more renewals probably in January oh, taking place compared right. to December the previous year. Right, um, right. Okay. So we only recognize that when you purchase an annual membership, we recognize that on a one twelfth basis over the next 12 months, so. Okay, Councilor Lehman. But don't we, if, if hypothetically, if you buy a year membership in June, don't we break it out by 12? Correct. And put July, August, September, October, November, December into each month of that current year yep. and carry over six months and yep. then break that carry over six months down by month. Correct. For, for each month of the second year. Correct. So this is just a snapshot in time. So at February 28th, we have $254,000 that's gonna be recognized over the next 12 months. So it's, it's, a, it's a rolling 12 months. And it's just a picture in time at that point in time, so. Ideally, we'll see that number continue to move up. Um, all right, further questions? Further questions of our monthly financial review? If not. Thank you very much, Council Thank members. you. All right, moving ahead. 8A2, paid parental leave. Nate's going to present. Welcome. Over it Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, at the February 12th, work session, we were asked to prepare some information on paid parental leave program. Uh, so this is in fulfillment of that. We're not making any recommendations at this point, so it's informational only. And if you want further action, you're gonna have to let us know. To understand the current situation related to paid parental leave in the city of Shakopee, you need to understand a little bit about the Family and Medical Leave Act. It's a federal law that applies to the city of Shakopee and it uh, applies regardless of gender. And I am focusing a little bit on uh, situations, uh, birth of a child, adoption of a child, or placement of a foster child. If an employee has been employed by the city for at least a year, if they've worked at least a minimum of 1,250 hours in the previous 12-month period, and if the employee has a qualifying event, uh, qualifying events, again, birth of a child, adoption, placement of a foster child, injury to themselves, injury to a family member, certain military situations, that's when FMLA applies. 
The employee is eligible for up to 12 weeks. Uh, we look at it as hours, actually, of an unpaid leave. So the federal law only requires that the leave is unpaid. The leave can be taken consecutively or only as needed, uh, which is called intermittent. Um, and then I did provide, provide you with a memo before that uh, suggested that we were going a little bit above and beyond related to continuing to pay health care benefits, but I just want to let you know uh, we dug into it a little bit further, um, talked with the attorneys a bit, and we are supposed to continue those health care benefits. So that's what the law requires. Here at the city of Shakopee are the employee experience, uh, again, particularly related to the birth of a child. Um, everyone's going to experience it a little bit differently in terms of their employment scenario. But generally, I can say that employees who have been employed by the city for at least a couple of years um, are going to have enough accrued time, sick or vacation, so that they're not really taking their 12 weeks of leave or however many weeks that they choose as an unpaid leave. Um, they've probably got enough accrued vacation to continue being paid for most of that. Uh, I went back and looked, and there have only been seven employees in the last three years who've taken any period of unpaid leave while they're on FMLA status. Uh, only one of those employees has been to, due to the birth, adoption, or foster play, placement of a child. Um, and I happen to know that that employee was out on paid leave for seven weeks and then on unpaid leave for one or two. Um, additionally, we offer employees AFLAC coverage here. The, the city doesn't pay any portion of that premium, but we um, make sure that, they, that we take it out of their payroll. Um, and for a woman, uh, if she does give birth to a child for about six weeks, we'll get about 60% of her pay during that time period. And that's actually regardless of whether or not she's on a paid status or an unpaid status. Um, in kind of preparing for this, I went and talked to a couple of employees, both male and female, who have experienced the birth of a child during their employment here in the last couple of years. Um, and they reported to me that the management here is really, really flexible with them, really supportive of um, trying to make sure that both leading up to the birth, after the birth of child, and then following the FMLA period, that people are able to manage uh, their work-life balance between uh, the things that they need to do to help their family, and then also take care of things here at work. So paid parental leave, just by way of background, is that um, the idea is that the city would provide an additional paid time off uh, typically, that's going to be for parents of either gender, uh, although I've seen uh, policies that are a little bit more favorable to females as opposed to males for various reasons. Um, just so you're aware, uh, if you've been following the news at all, there are a couple of big, uh, there's both a House file and Senate file that have been getting hearings and a lot of movement lately um, to establish a paid parental leave program that would be mandatory and would be statewide. Um, I can get into that if you're interested later into terms of what that would look like. There are a couple of other organizations that are making a shift. Um, typically, I see that the private sector is kind of leading the way. Um, I didn't dive too deeply into this, but just to kind of give you an idea, 3M and General Mills offer two, 20 weeks of paid parental leave for both male and female parents, um, and Cargill offers two weeks. Uh, for government organizations, just a quick scan, Richfield's two weeks, Minneapolis is three, uh, Brooklyn Park is two, St. Louis Park is three, and the state of Minnesota is six. I would say that paid parental leave is becoming somewhat of an expectation among employees of a certain demographic, and what I mean by that is millennials and younger. Um, Work-life balance to that generation is extraordinarily, extraordinarily important, um, and obviously those are the, that's the generation that's currently of primary childbearing age. So I tried to attach kind of a price tag to what it would take to adopt a policy for paid parental leave, and it's pretty complicated. Um, but if we were to adopt a policy that in its very basic form said that any employee who's FMLA eligible has a qualifying event such as the birth of a child, adoption of a child, or placement of a foster child would be eligible for one week of leave. It would be, it's difficult to project because all of our employees tend to make different rates. Um, and then also, I don't, you know, you can't guess how many, fair, I can go back and look at averages, but saying how many um, employees there are going to be that would take this leave is kind of difficult. So I can tell you right now, I know of three that would be eligible under this policy in the next couple of months. 
Um, so my projection of five for 2019 might already be pretty close to being underneath, underneath that. But just to, to kind of give you a ballpark understanding of, of what the expense would be, I assume that there would be about five qualifying events each year. Um, 2018 actually was 10. Uh, 2017, to my understanding, was six. Um, so it'll be, it'll be variable. Approximately half of those employees would require that their shifts are, culter, are covered, resulting in overtime costs. Uh, so about half of our employees are the type of employees where you have to replace them when they're not here. Police officers, sometimes public works uh, employees, and others. So, and then I use the median pay rate to kind of ballpark what I think this would cost. Um, if you did adopt that policy above, I would estimate, again, given the five potential events in a given year, or on average, about $7,500 in lost productivity costs. Now, this isn't dollars that you would have to allocate anywhere. This is an employee is being paid, but they are not in the office. So work is going to have to be shifted from their workload to somebody else's, or we're just going to have to defer it for a while. And then about $5,600 in direct costs. And this would, be a, the occur, this would occur when, um, say, a police officer is out on paid parental leave for a week. Uh, we would have to cover all of those shifts that that person had or that police officer had with an overtime um, police officer. So that would be for one week, estimating five instances per year. Uh, that would be the total cost of the policy, not per occasion. So just to be clear on that. Um, from my perspective, the, the cost and benefits of the paid parental leave policy is it, it, it potentially improves, improves our recruitment standing. Um, it potentially improves employee retention. Um, and then I would, I would stress that those two points above really matter particularly with employees that can move freely between the public and private sectors. So our IT people, our HR people, administrative staff primarily, uh, less so with police officers and um, public works folks. Uh, on the disadvantaged side, there is a cost associated with it. And then I would say that we aren't um, super overstaffed here. We do tend to run a lean operation. So it is a little bit difficult sometimes when somebody's out for an extended period of time to kind of manage those situations, make sure the work that needs to get done is getting done. So basically, this just summarizes what I've just uh, told you. Um, the other thing, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, one thing that we do to be extra flexible is we have a leave donation policy that the council adopted about two years ago that we have used in certain extenuating circumstances. Um, so we allow other employees to donate hours of their leave to another employee so that they can use it in the event something happens. Um, beyond that, I think I would just stand for questions if you have any. I have, I just want to clarify and make sure that I, so the, the costs, the combined two of the, the numbers you show is about $13,000. That would be the annual cost of five events at a week each. Approximately, yes. Thank you. Councillor uh, Whiting. Uh, if, if an employee goes on FMLA or uh, Minnesota parenting leave, uh, what is their rate of pay? If they are on an FMLA leave, well, their rate of pay would be the same if they had the hours accrued. So we have both vacation and sick time that they can use. If they had, it would be zero because if they didn't, they weren't using their, so their as, vacation or accrued time. Uh, Councillor Whiting, as part of our policy, um, we require that staff that have vacation or sick balances use that time if they are on FMLA leave down to 40 hours in each bank. So if you have 300 hours total between the two, we'll draw them both down to 40 and then, we, then we'll let you go on to unpaid time. So most employees don't hit unpaid, won't hit unpaid time for at least six to eight weeks, just on average, I would say. But that depends on if they have the time available. That is correct. Uh, do, uh, do uh, and I, I don't, didn't, from your presentation, I came up with this question, so I'm not sure if you know the answer or not, but on a family medical leave, the FMLA, 
can you take that time off for uh, sickness or an issue with a family member like a parent? Yes, you can. You can. That's correct. So that is another mm -hmm. potential. Um, and I, and I see that kind of with this, if, if this policy was adopted, that with the silver tsunami, people are growing older, uh, parents uh, are having issues. I would see that as uh, something that could be used in a, in a parental leave act uh, or policy also, uh, in addition to what we've talked about. Um, but uh, I, I do see it as a great recruiting tool too, and, and uh, another way of keeping some employee retention, but. I'll open it up for anybody else who want to comment. Councilor Lehman. <clears throat> I think the current policy we have is bad, actually better than the standalone uh, FLMC or whatever it's called, FLM, F, FMLA. Jeez. Um, because that, in my understanding, isn't required if it was a standalone to provide the internal policies that we do of where we have the ability for other employees to donate uh, so we actually can cover individuals that uh, don't have time built up um, and potentially even cover all of their leave uh, if that's the wishes of by choice donations. Um, so I think that's a great policy and I think that uh, builds a lot of team spirit. Uh, I think that's a great uh, tool for recruitment on its own merits. I think it says a lot about the organization working together. Um, and I, I think this is a little bit premature for me if there's Senate and House discussions about bills, I'd hate to put something in place and have to turn around and change it right away. So I guess I'm gonna take a wait and see attitude and uh, say that what we're doing is, is, is better uh, so far. And uh, that's kind of cool to see. Uh, Councilor Brennan, Brennan, you want to weigh in on this? Um, nope, I, I agree with Matt. Um, I think I'd rather wait and see what's going on with the state. Councilor Contreras? Yes, I, I can. I mean, knowing that there is something and listening to what Mr. Lehman's saying, too, if it's a better, you know, what we currently have, maybe we don't want to just wait. I mean, we just might wait. I don't know. No, there are there are some things going through the legislature, and, and uh, as we've all seen, some of those take, some of those don't. Um, in the policy we have, where people can employees can donate their vacation time to other employees, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not always going to be the case in the situation that comes up. Um, in my point of view, if a person has a qualifying event and we can decide on that, which could be the birth of a child or for a parent, a mother or father, or, or adopting of a child, or uh, in what I suggested, you know, if you have to put your parents in a nursing home and need some time off. Um, in, in the memo here, it states that some of our employees feel obligated that they have to come back because there are issues with pay. And you do want to have a, a people in a comfortable position, and, and I'm not suggesting a full-time pay. You know, I think what most of the averages are is a few weeks at 60%, I've seen several of them at. Uh, we could peg that at any kind of rate of pay, but it gives a person an opportunity to take, you know, have that few weeks off at a reduced rate of pay, knowing that their job is gonna be here, that they'll have the time to uh, bond with their family member or take care of the, the business that they do. You know, I'm not suggesting we put this in tomorrow because it's not in our budget cycle, but it is something I think we could move forward with after we take a look at what the state does and plan for it in our budget and uh, kind of maybe do a little more background on it. So um, I see where everyone wants to go with this, but I think it's something we do need to consider in the future. Excellent. Uh, Councilor Lehman. Hey, I, Councilor Whiting raises a good question of staff. Hypothetically, if uh, an employee wanted to take some time off for an event, you say typically they buy down their own vacation or sick accrued time. Are they able to currently buy that down at half? Let's say I, if I was an employee and I said, you know, I, I'm gonna miss two weeks. I wanna be paid 50% per day out of my account. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Lehman, no. We, it's an hour for hour. You know, typically an employee is expected to be in the, you know, working 40 hours a week and it's an hour for hour. It would frankly be an administrative nightmare to try and allow that. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Reynolds. One of the things we do uh, uh, do uh, is that we allow employees to take uh, time during the day. Uh, it doesn't have to be consecutive time. Uh, especially with young children, we find that uh, uh, mothers want to be away, but then want to come back, but then they have to go away for a couple of days. And we're actually pretty flexible in that regards. We want to do everything we can to, to assist and keep good employees. And uh, uh, I'm comfortable with the, with, with the policy that we have now. That being said, uh, we are constantly looking at our benefits and we're constantly looking at uh, what we offer. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the marketplace determines that we are out of sync, we will know about that. And then when that happens, we will bring something forward for you to review and, and basically outline why we think that we need to do it. So uh, it is something that we will continually to look at. Um. Further discussion of uh, Nate? If not, thank you for this workup. Um, I found the information informative. Um, I work for a large corporation. They have paid leave, but they also have the FMLA. And um, in my department, I just, I just see a lot of sometimes abuse of the FMLA where uh, they burn up their vacation or they're sick, and then as soon as that's out, you know, they come right back to work, work another month, earn another day or two to, you know. And I'm going, well, what is this really for? What is it really designed for? And yes, there are, you know, those times when you've got to need that time. So FMLA is a placeholder, uh, more specifically if it's for uh, something a little more defined. and. Maybe we can get there. Um, you know, maybe it's something that the state will mandate on us. Um, we will see down the line. Good discussion. Um, all right, great, thank you. If there's no other questions, then uh, we have our 9A, our uh, city bill, bill list for your review. And then we would have 9B, liaison and administration, uh, Councilor Brennan. Um, I went to scale general meeting and we learned about or we had a presentation on the treatment court that is done through Scott County which provides um, nonviolent drug addiction offenders treatment um, is pretty interesting um, they had the judges and the um, attorneys there and um, a representative from the Shakopee Police Police Department um, so that was good. Um, I also went to the public safety, scale public safety training facility meeting. Um, and a couple of things that they have on their budget or planning to have on their budget is a boiler replacement. Um, and the bids are out for that. Um, they're anticipating about a $390,000 um, cost on that, but the bids are out. Um, and also a shingle replacements on three buildings, um, but they have to wait to get the bids for the snow to leave. Um, and then uh, they also provided a 2018 usage report, if anybody would like to see that. Um, and I also went to, yesterday I went to the new officer swearing in of Alex Godfrey, and I, it, was, it was touching. I mean, he, he called his mom up and had him pin, pin his badge on. He's badge number 90, and it was, it was very nice. I wish him well. And that's it. Great. Um. Thank you, Councilor Lehman. Can, uh, can she share that usage for the training facility with staff so the rest of us can see it? Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> and then who, how do they pay for these yeah. improvements? We have a CIP. Like, with the money that we give them? Okay. That does to the books, huh? And I suppose we'll have to pay that, twice as much. That boiler's now. been on the CIP for quite a while, I think. <laughs> Probably cheaper to change it over to forest forest heat or something that old building i don't know um, <clears throat> new building they put in a fireplace a lot of woods out there <laughs> <clears throat> all right um attended a spuck meeting last night uh let's see Thirty-two thousand five hundred feet of 750 mcm underground cable for the canterbury project bids came in as like five something a foot 
I guess that's pretty good. Um, two power outages, one was a tree branch, 29 customers, uh, about an hour. Second was a bad transformer piece. They had to change out a transformer. 34 customers, that was two hours. And then they're continuing to work on relays and SCADA upgrades at the various substations, trying to get that done now before the peak heating season hits, or cooling city season, I guess, would peak power usage. So uh, that's my report for tonight. All right, thank you very much. Um, I don't... Uh, I don't have any events that I uh, per se went to in the last week. I did meet with city staff, but uh, uh, part of 2019, I've been thinking about liaison reports and um, we always talk backwards of things that we've done and that's great. Great information about the different liaisons, but I also do like to promote what's happening in our community. So Thursday night, this Thursday, March 21st, our Shockby Police Department is having their top secret project at the West Middle School, uh, 68 p.m. Uh, learn more about the potential risks that our young teens face. Um, this Saturday, March 23rd, is Rotary's Little Chicago Casino Night at Canterbury, and I do believe tickets are still available. Um, a marker on your calendar, April 13th, uh, Shockby's Easter Egg Hunt for our children, 11, 11 a.m. at our community center, and there's a uh, several hours of activities, so I think that is good. And then uh, talking to Bill Reynolds and uh, a very big deal, the NHL alumni game, April 13th, same day as Easter, for a great cause, uh, the Parkinson Foundation of Minnesota. Doors are open at 2.30 p.m. There's a kid's skate. You can get autographs and photos. There's actually a kid's skill competition that may be interest, that may be pretty cool. Uh, the game, the NHL alumni game, starts at 5.15 with a party afterwards. I think the 20 tickets are $20 for a great uh, uh, great cause of the um, Parkinson Foundation of Minnesota. So a couple ideas to, to percolate. And that's my report, Councilor Whiting. Uh, thank you. I had no liaison reports. Thank you. Councilor Contreras. Um, on the 8th, I met with the Scott County CDA representatives uh, looking for ways to work with diverse communities, um, and they're offering classes for homeowner counseling and education. Uh, these programs are available, um, you know, to get uh, these homeowners ready, well, these potential homeowners ready for purchasing homes. And then on the 11th, I was at the school board meeting. Uh, the district is working on updating its school safety and crisis management plan. Um, staff and administrators will begin training and, uh, uh, on a curriculum um, called PREPARE. Uh, PREPARE is a training, the pre PREPARE training is, a, is ideal for schools committed to improving and strengthening uh, their school's uh, safety and crisis management plan and emergency response. And about 100 um, Shakopee school staff are expected to start to take the first part of the training in August. So just to, you know, be prepared for to be able to support our students if there ever is some type of a crisis, be there to help them out. Very good. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, our administration report. Just two things, Mayor. First of all, the Rotary fundraiser tickets are still available, but get them soon because uh, we're in the process of planning that for Saturday and making sure that we have all the uh, food and everything else that we need. It will be held at Canterbury Park. It is our largest fundraiser of the year. Uh, I had my first meeting as chair of the service delivery committee for scale uh, had a couple good uh, things that uh, hopefully we can work in context with the county uh, one of the things that uh, both uh, um, the city of savage the city of prior lake and the city of shakopee have have kind of dealt with in different ways are what to do with pro properties that uh, uh, are to unhealthy to the extent that it's causing problems for either the occupants or their neighbors. And we're not talking about simply messy properties. We're talking about uh, serious hoarding properties, serious uh, 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 insect infestations and those kinds of things. And uh, the city of Shakopee currently doesn't have a way to really deal with that. And so I've been here almost four years now. And one of the first things that I did was to go to the county and, and talk about the county using its police powers for health and safety essentially to try to work out a way to assist the communities with these particular properties. Um, and 
it's been back and forth over the years, and uh, we just heard the latest iteration of that on on uh, Monday. And uh, uh, hopefully that's something that will be brought for the county so they can then assist. And it would be through the public health department, so the public health would have the uh, the ability to go into some of these places. And um, uh, you know, there there really are some places out there that cause it. And for me, my big worry is 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 adults that. Uh, um, that, that aren't mentally capable to understanding the issues that they're having or children. And so this is, a, this is an opportunity to, to uh, essentially make that a safer place for them. So uh, we'll see where that heads in the future. Uh, the, we're continuing to work that issue out and it will be uh, at the county board at some point uh, based upon uh, our initial discussions in the last couple of days. Good. All right, thank you, Culture Whiting. Uh, you you talked about the service uh, delivery committee. Would would other communities, and I don't know how we've done this in the past with us, with our electrical inspector, if there was extra time, could that be contracted to another city? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Councillor Whiting, and it's something that uh, you know if I can make a buck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, some, that's something. That's something to think about, and uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll actually ask and see if that's something that. Because I don't even know what our neighbors do in that regards, and that, that's an interesting point. The other thing, I didn't want to step on your thunder, but I think our executive director of the Scott County Historical Society is retiring, and that is on Thursday night. That's correct, yes. And uh, I was on the board to hire her, so I uh, plan on being there to uh, wish her a, a happy retirement. So if you're available, I, is that at 6 o'clock? It is at 6 o'clock, and uh, it is at the Shakopee Brew Hall. Uh, and uh, I am currently on the board, so uh, I should have mentioned that, yes. Um, excellent. Thank you. Um, item number 10, Councillor Lehman, other business. Mayor, I just have one point, a comment I'd like to make. Most of us know Jack Cole. Long time service in our community, principal of junior high when I was in school. Very good man, uh, dedicated to the community and service to this community. He's passed away. Uh, Jack Cole is one of them leaders in our community that steered me in a positive direction at a time in my life when I probably needed it. Although I think everybody at that age needs a little bit of direction. Um, I've had the opportunity to tell him thank you many times over the years. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again. Uh, he was a great, great person in our community. Served it well, and sorry to see him go. Isn't he a bad director, too? Or? You know, he was in everything. He was at Rotary for a long time. He was a uh, uh, foreign exchange student program. Um, I think he touched everybody one way or the other. Bridging. Pardon? Bridging. Bridging. That was one of his passions in the last few years. Uh, just a just great guy. Someone that touched our community and, and worked at trying to make our community better mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. Um, you, know, I, uh, you know, and I think those people leave an indelible footprint in the community and, and touch people and impact them in a positive way and um, forever thankful for that. You know, it, we were congratulating uh, Pinky tonight too as well. Uh, you know, how 36 years of trying to make our community better and going through all those ups and downs, uh, people like that, I, I really admire and appreciate, so. All right. Um, no other business in front of this, oh, Councilor White. There may be opportunities in the future so that we can commemorate some of these good citizens and, and uh, remember them or at least send a, a, a resolution of, of, of honorarium or something, you know, something that we could do as a council to uh, remember them. Hopefully we are doing that when they're living and, and not in the past tense, but uh, maybe we can do that in the future. All right. Thank you all. Uh, motion? Motion to adjourn. Hmm? Second to <laughs> Tuesday, April 2nd. At 7 p.m.? Yes. I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, we are adjourned at 9.05. Thank you. Louder. We have to sign.